Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to the Suleiman Ravid Show. We're coming to you live this Friday evening from our studios here in Sunning Hill, Johannesburg. Uh, the first Friday after the month of Ramadan. Can you believe it? The month has uh, come and gone. Uh, on, 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 uh, on, in Ramadan, rather, we were um, coming to you live on Sunday mornings. Uh, now we're back onto the uh, usual slot. Uh, the first Friday after this um, this great month. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us uh, barakah uh, in every day of our lives and may the, the spiritual energy and the momentum that we generated in Ramadan continue to benefit us um, after this great month. Now, uh, earlier this week, uh, the president addressed the nation and he said that uh, religious gatherings will now be allowed up to a maximum of 50 people and with certain restrictions and conditions. This now obviously... Uh, makes it possible for the masajid to open within that uh, particular uh, scope. And uh, this is a welcome relief for many people, considering that uh, the masajid have been closed for the better part of uh, two months. Uh, there are others. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw Julius Malema's uh, comments uh, earlier on, saying that it's still too dangerous, it's too, still too risky, etc. So we're going to be discussing now the, the uh, reopening of the uh, masajid. Uh, with uh, Maulana Yusuf Patel, who is the Secretary General of the United Ulama Council of uh, South Africa, known as UKSA. Maulana joins us uh, on the line this evening. Maulana, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh and welcome to the program. Maulana Yusuf, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh and welcome to the program. Okay, I'm not able to... Mona, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me? All right, we're going to just try and get uh, Mona Yusuf back on the line, inshallah, uh, to be able to do the program. Um, let, let's talk about uh, this week after Ramadan, you know. Uh, just as this week has lapsed, it's a good opportunity now, four, four days later, to just check what is our, our routine like. How much of the momentum of Ramadan have we been able to, uh, to sustain? Uh, I think I mentioned this during the last program that we did in Ramadan, the last Sunday. Uh, that Sunday that we all expected was uh, to be Eid, the Sunday that passed uh, earlier this week. Uh, that you won't be able to match what you did in Ramadan in terms of quantity. If you're reading five Jews a day of Quran, you won't be able to do that much. Uh, if you're fasting 30 days consecutively, you won't be able to fast that much outside of Ramadan. Ramadan has its own environment, its own atmosphere, its own uh, uh, flavor. And at the same time, uh, you know, you, you kind of uh, adjust your routine specifically for those 30 days. Ayyama ma'adudat. Now, going forward, uh, you go back to a, to, a, to a different kind of routine. And that is not what is expected, that you must match the quantity of what you do in Ramadan outside of Ramadan. What is expected is that you remain steadfast on those actions, um, even if it be to a lesser extent. Uh, you don't have to fast 30 days consecutively, but you try and keep some nafil fast. Uh, the 6th of Shawwal, Monday and Thursday every week, or at least the Ayyam Ibid, the 13th, 14th, and 15th of um, every lunar month. Then uh, if you consider the, the aspect of reading Quran, you may not be able to read that much, but read something, you know, read one juice, read half a juice every day. Uh, the same with dhikr, the same with your nafil salah. Obviously, make sure your farad salah is in order first. Um, and, and the most important thing, the most important thing is abstention from sin. This is where many of us fail. We kind of give up certain habits in Ramadan. It's almost like we put our bad habits on pause, but uh, we do not uh, stop it. We do not cancel it. We do not uh, delete it. And um, what, what transpires here is that uh, immediately after Ramadan, we then go back to our bad habits. Immediately after Ramadan, we need to go, we go back uh, to, to, to that uh, non-ideal routine. So the longer you let that continue after the day of Eid, the more difficult it becomes to pull it back. Therefore, it's imperative that you do, you do an analysis right now, even though it's just a few days after Eid, uh, and see, you know, what, what is my state? What is my spiritual state like uh, in as far as um, uh, my routine is concerned? Have I gone back to some of my bad habits? Am I, uh, am I, am I sustaining 
the good actions in my, in my routine. Routine is the key word. You have to inject and you need to establish these things uh, in your routine. Now, I'm just waiting for some sort of an indication in terms of uh, where we are. Uh, we were supposed to have had Mahi Yusuf Patel on the line uh, via Skype. Uh, that didn't work for some reason. Uh, now we're trying to get him uh, on the line uh, telephonically. Uh, I'm just waiting for some indication uh, if, if Moana is going to be with us on the line. And, and we discussed the, the issue here in terms of um, the partial opening now of uh, the places of prayer, uh, places of, um, of, of worship. And uh, if, if that can happen uh, shortly, then we will commence that discussion with Moana Yusuf Patel. Otherwise, we'll have to take a break and see uh, what, what the situation is and, and try and rectify and uh, remedy that. All right, so welcome back. I think we've got Moana Yusuf Patel, the Secretary General of UKSA, with us on the line from Middleburg. Moana, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to the program. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the President addressed the nation earlier this week, um, and we, we got the news that many were hoping for a partial opening of places of, of prayer. For many, especially within the Muslim community, I'm sure in other faith-based communities as well, it was a, a welcome consideration. Uh, but there are others, uh, Julius Malema's comments have been doing the rounds, who see it as an irresponsible short-term relief. What, what are your thoughts in this regard, Ma? Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Uh, there has been mixed reaction to the announcement by the president uh, permitting a maximum number of 50 people to attend uh, religious gatherings. And if you, look at, uh, if you look across the religious divide, there were some Christian groups who regard the opening of uh, places of prayer as unwise, uh, saying that the spike in infections uh, makes it very dangerous for people to congregate. Likewise, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies uh, spokesperson also expressed concern, uh, saying that there were many, many outbreaks uh, that emanate from religious gatherings. Uh, if you look at some of the political re uh, response, as you've stated, the EFF has also expressed its disappointment, saying that allowing people to go to places of religious worship will simply expedite their meeting with their Creator. Uh, on the other hand, you had the African uh, Christian Democratic Party, which welcomed the opening of places of prayer, as did the South African Council of Churches. Now, when it comes to the Muslims, I think Muslims in general were elated, extremely happy, and extremely, uh, uh, you know, satisfied that they are now able to go and pray and read Salah in the uh, masjid. And I think we need to understand that for Muslims, Muslims were the most impacted regarding the closure of places of prayer. For so some, uh, it meant not going to a place of prayer uh, once a week or twice a week. But for us, it meant not going to prayer five times a day. And what made it more challenging is that we had to do this in the month of Ramadan uh, and we had to do so on the day of Eid. Now, for Muslims, uh, the place of prayer, the masjid, is, not, is more than just uh, a, a place where we go and discharge a responsibility or an obligation. Uh, the masjid gives us a sense of belonging it develops and provides a community spirit, which is, uh, you know, part of the uh, uh, part of the values of Ramadan, etc. So for us, it was extremely challenging, and yes, I think 
generally from the Muslim community, people uh, have, you know, uh, have uh, embraced the opening of the masajid with a, with a sense of relief and happiness. There's been a, a debate um, within the Muslim community about whether Uqsa made an about turn regarding their call for no large congregations. Yes, I think the general agreement, not only among Uqsa members, but all faith groups, is that congregations were never meant to be restricted indefinitely. They were never meant to be restricted until a cure is eventually found. As UKSA, as the United Ulama Council of South Africa, we draw our cue from experts in the field, from the Islamic Medical Association and various experts that advise the government. Now, the original call by the medical experts was isolation as a response to the spread of the pandemic. And the, this held true for level five and level four, and which has now subsequently changed, and we are now in level three. Now the phased opening of places of prayer is in line with the views of medical experts who suggest that we have to now migrate from a, a lockdown strategy and embrace the need for appropriate social behavior. And given the fact that the virus is going to be with us for a long, long time, perhaps even a year from today, so uh, their advice is we have to learn to live alongside the virus and ensure that only the most susceptible uh, people, people who are sick or aged, etc., uh, uh, you know, opt for some kind of isolation. Now we must remember, and I think this is critical, that circumstances regarding the pandemic remain extremely fluid and unpredictable. Our response, therefore, needs to be adaptable. It needs to be flexible based on realities on the ground. What holds true today may not hold true tomorrow. And therefore, the, the fact that we have to change our approach in dealing with the p pandemic is very much consistent with the advice given to us by the medical experts. So the very nature of the pandemic requires a constant reappraisal, uh, reappraisal of uh, you know, policy. And I don't think that necessarily equates to a turnabout. Now that we have uh, a partial opening of, of, of the masjid, what are some of the challenges that we have to deal with as, as a Muslim community? Well, I think there are several change, uh, challenges that we have to deal with. Number one and foremost is how do we manage admitting 50 people at a time for the five daily prayers? And more importantly, how do we manage our Juma uh, Fala, given that the average population may be 500 or 600 people for Fala, uh, Juma Fala? How do we ensure that we are able to perform Fala, Juma Fala, and the five daily Fala without breaching any of the regulations? I think that's one of the most important and most critical challenge. Number two, it is also critically important for communities to self-police them, uh, you know, to self-regulate or self-police uh, themselves in terms of compliance. The challenge that trustees face is to ensure compliance to regulations. And this requires 
the general co cooperation of all Muslims. So that's the second challenge. The third challenge is not all masajid have the necessary resources to ensure sanitization of pre premises after each salah. And therefore, it, uh, as a collective, it becomes important for us uh, to, to, to direct necessary uh, resources to masajid that are lo located in less, privi less privileged areas. Uh, uh, you know, it's for uh, affluent co communities, it may be easy to follow the hygiene protocols. However, there are uh, masajid in very poor communities, uh, which find, uh, and they uh, find it extremely difficult to fulfill or meet the hygiene protocols. Another challenge is how do we ensure that people who come to the masjid follow the regulations in terms of wearing the mask, in terms of social distan distancing, etc. So self-regulation is uh, a, you know, a very critical challenge that the community has to deal with. Uh, another challenge which is uh, very uh, critical and important is that how do we conscientize our people that the rate of infection is escalating at a alarming level? The need to act responsibly and within the confines of regulations remain as important as ever. So the opening of uh, places of worship does not in any way reflect that the, we have won the battle against the pandemic or that we are out of the woods. And I think, uh, uh, you know, finally in terms of these challenges, uh, how do we get people in our community to disagree in an agreeable manner on a myriad of issues pertaining to the masjid. The lockdown has laid bare the fault lines within the Muslim community, often characterized by intolerance uh, and prejudice. So some of these are some of the challenges in the wake of the lockdown itself and uh, with regards to the partial uh, opening of the masajid. If, if I can just ask a question based on that, what, what advice would you give to musallis as well as mutawallis, those who are responsible for the affairs of the, of the masjid, when it comes to issues on which there are differing views, uh, differing fatawa? Uh, take the issue of social distancing, for example. There are certain muftis who say under the circumstances it's permitted. There are other muftis who say that uh, they, there's no need. There are those who say it's a legal requirement. There are others who say that the, 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 the law doesn't specifically state how many meters you need to stand apart, et cetera, et cetera. H how do you deal with that dynamic when those differing views are then like, likely to filter down uh, to a congregation within a particular masjid? I think maybe there are two parts to the question. One is that uh, what about some of the masajid that opt not to open under these circumstances? For example, the Muslim Judicial Council uh, in the Western Cape has advised uh, masajid to remain closed for another 30 days, given that the Western Cape has become the epicenter of the spread of the virus. And likewise, there are several masajid in our areas uh, who also uh, have opted to remain closed. And I think uh, what is required from us as a community is to give the trustees the space to make that kind of determination without uh, condemning them
for uh, the uh, position they adopt. That's the first thing. The other issue is that, you know, there are, uh, there's debate on a host of issues, uh, social distancing, wearing of the mask, sanitizing, keeping a record of people who come to the masjid, uh, etc. And the, the harsh reality is that we are not going to get consensus on these matters. And the only way to deal with this is that each masjid should have their own point of reference. And if they trust and have confidence in a certain organization or certain Darul Ifta, uh, they should follow the guidelines given by the organization they, they trust and, they, uh, and uh, the, Dar or the organization or the Darul Ifta that they normally refer to. That's the only way we can manage our differences. Uh, uh, you know, there is, we're not going to get consensus. Uh, uh, there are various fatwas, as you correctly point out. And uh, we need to be big enough to, uh, you know, agree, disagree in an agreeable manner. If we look at it, uh, you know, we, we've, it's already two months now, I think, since the, the process has commenced. And as you mentioned earlier on, uh, Allah alone knows how much longer we are going to have to deal with, with, the, with the reality of this kind of adjusted uh, lifestyle because of, of the pandemic. What, what are some of the lessons that we can take away from the pandemic itself? I say, uh, you know, when we think and when we uh, when we think of a pandemic, it conjures up images of an indiscriminate, uncontainable, uh, or irre irrepressible virus that swiftly sweeps across continents. Uh, as Muslims, we believe that Allah is the master of the universe. He is in absolute control. No virus spreads outside the control and domain of Allah. Nothing happens naturally without measure, without purpose, without design. And the virus did not suddenly appear with a life on, of its own. Nor did it become a global pandemic by sheer chance because people were tra traveling across borders. The world did not suddenly come to a, an abrupt stop, nor did our lives come to an abrupt halt, uh, you know, by sheer coincidence. As Muslims, we believe that whatever has happened and whatever happens, there is a divine purpose. There is meaning to what is happening. In my view, the virus is but a gentle knock on the door for every human being. A warning and a reminder from Allah that, oh, you man, pause, reflect, reflect at your own significance, and take lesson from what you see and experience. Allah says in the Quran, and I quote, we have sent messengers to nations before you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then we seized them with poverty and hardship that perhaps they might humble themselves before us. Then Allah asked, why? Why when our punishment came to them, did they not humble themselves? But their hearts became hardened, and shaitan made attractive, attractive to them that which they were doing. So when they forgot that by which they had been reminded, we opened to them the doors of prosperity or of every good, until when they rejoiced in what they were given, which suddenly seized them, and they were left in total despair. 
This is a verse of the Quran. And this verse is very significant. It says that the purpose behind these hardships is that we are driven to humbling ourselves before Allah. We are driven to seek His forgiveness. We are driven to reflect and make changes in the way we live. If we fail to do so, He will then open the floodgates of prosperity. People will then assume that what happened was part of, natural, part of the natural cycle. Allah will then shower them with prosperity of all kinds to the extent that they believe that they have been rewarded for their disobedience. And when that happens, Allah will eventually seize them with a more permanent uh, punishment. So, my message is that if nothing has changed in our lives since the beginning of the lockdown, if we are going to come out of this in exactly the same manner we entered it, Allah forbid that we become of those whose hearts have become hardened. So we need to use this occasion to reflect, to introspect, and to reform and to make changes in our uh, uh, very lives. We need to understand that there is now going to be a new normal which is going to require uh, a different behavior from us. So I think the most critical lesson that we can learn from this pandemic is that this hasn't happened by chance. It has happened by design, by the will of Allah. And our challenge is to respond appropriately. Lastly, before I let you go, Moana, we know that uh, the issue of the suspension of congregational prayer in the Masajid uh, and some of the other decisions taken uh, by Uqsa and uh, by some of the uh, members of Uqsa, the, the ulama bodies, uh, have become issues of contention, of, of debate, uh, and, and to be honest, it has created quite a bit of division within the Muslim community. As you think back over the happenings of the last two months, uh, how do you analyze it, and, and what, what lesson do you learn from it, and, and, and what do you think we, we should take heed of going forward? I think the lesson of life is that we have our own unique, independent processes of thought. We, are, we have our own DNA. We may look at the same picture and come to different conclusions. And I think very critical is the verse in the Quran that says, O Prophet of Allah, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةِ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ that it is purely on account of the mercy of Allah that you deal gently, you deal uh, softly with uh, the people you interact and engage with. And Allah says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيدَ الْقَوْبِ That if you are prophet of Allah, were crude in your in, uh, attitude, harsh, Hearted, in other words, uh, intolerant, then fadum in haulik. They, the companions, would have uh, dispersed and scattered away from you. They would be extremely uncomfortable in your presence. And this verse was revealed at the occasion of Uhud when uh, Muslims suffered a near defeat. And yet Allah is saying, be tolerant, O Prophet of Allah. Do not adopt a harsh, hard, or high-handed attitude. And then Allah goes on to say, fa'fu anhum. Be tolerant. Pardon people. 
for their shortcomings, which presupposes that except that as human beings don't think alike, human beings have their own unique DNA, they would come to different conclusions, they have different preferences, and what is required from us, especially in leadership positions, is be tolerant, be forgiving. Wastafir lahum was the sec- a second command given to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if they have erred, then seek forgiveness for them, turn to Allah and beg Allah to forgive those who have mm-hmm. erred. And number three, washahawirhum fil amr, O Prophet of Allah, consult adequately. Now, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, was a recipient of divine revelation. There was no need for him to consult. Yet Allah is teaching the Ummah through him that the process of consultation, we need to be inclusive in how we make decisions, especially in leadership positions. So Allah said, وَشَاوِرُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ and the fourth instruction given in this verse is فَيْذَعْذَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you have consulted as widely as you possibly can, then adopt your resolu- resolution and the trust in Allah. Mm-hmm. There is the balance. You have did what is humanly possible. You have... Uh, come to a conclusion through mutual consultation. Now, please, you trust in Allah and leave matters in the hands of Allah. And I think this verse speaks volumes, especially for the challenges we find ourselves in today, for the kind of divisions that we have to deal with uh, within the uh, Muslim leadership and more particularly within the ulama fraternity, uh, it is, you know, our challenge is to reflect a diversity of Qur'an. There's nothing wrong uh, to say we have heard. There's nothing wrong to say, uh, to review your position. You know, what is very significant is when uh, uh, the Iblis refused to obey the commandment of Allah, and Allah asked him why. His response was, "Qala sabima akwaitani," because you led me astray. In other words, he refused to take responsibility. He put, he pointed his finger to Allah and said, "You are to blame for the circumstances that I find myself in." When Allah asked Nabi Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, why did you eat uh, from uh, the tree that you were told not to approach? His response was, Rabbana zalamna anfusuna, we've wronged ourselves. Mm. So the satanic attribute is to say it's your fault. The prophetic attribute is to say, look inside and say, ah, have I contributed to the circumstances that I find myself in. Mahana, Jazakumullah, so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. I mean, assalamu alaikum to you and to the audience of ITV. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was Mahana Yusuf Patel, the Secretary General of the United Ulama Council of South Africa. Right, so just to, to wrap up the program then and to reemphasize some of the points, we now have a partial reopening of the masajid. We know what the rules are. Um, there will be difference of opinions in terms of fatwas and theological viewpoints. This is not the time to fight and argue. Uh, every masjid has its leadership. Once the leadership has made a decision, then you, you rally behind them and uh, you have to support them. Otherwise, every person in that congregation would have their own view. And if they exercise one view, or, I mean, if they follow one view, there'll be people in the congregation who would feel they would have to follow another view. The masjid is a place where we ought to be united, not disunited. There are varying views and all the views come from uh, respective uh, uh, 
uh, respected um, you know, bodies and, and, and individuals. So this is the time to be disciplined, not to see how we can beat the system. This is the time to self-regulate. It should not be that Allah forbid, we are granted now an opportunity to once again go to the masjid, although in a limited sense, that if there's an outbreak within a particular masjid, then that masjid shuts down and all the families then have to go into quarantine. Um, we wouldn't want a situation like this. So government obviously cannot police everyone in every masjid, in every place of worship. But let's try from our own side to be as disciplined and as responsible as we can. And last but not least, Moana touched on a very important point, that this entire pandemic uh, should have resulted in us changing our lives by now, becoming better Muslims. Together with that, Ramadan has come and gone. I want to end the program with what I mentioned right up front, that they uh, use this weekend to take stock, that since Ramadan has lapsed, in this half a week, what is my routine looking like? What is my level of spirituality like? Uh, I can't match in terms of quantity what I did in Ramadan, but I have to tailor a routine where I continue with the good actions. Uh, I have to tailor a routine where I continue to abstain from the wrong actions, where abstention from sin is right up on the list after fulfilling of the fara'id, so that I maintain now the closeness that I've achieved to Allah wa ta'ala, and that I take lesson from the outbreak of this virus and this pandemic, and that is that Allah is knocking on my door and giving me a wake-up call. Until next week, inshallah, fi manillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.